Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series tonight. Our friend and longtime guest at Folks, author, best selling author with New York Times best selling writ list for a number of his titles, Rich Cohen. And his latest book, which is published, is out today. So I say, I would say we are the first stop on his book tour The Adventures of Herbie Cohen the world's greatest negotiator. I will tell you that he has a, of course, it has a similar last name, and that's because uh, Rich Cohen is the son of Herbie Cohen, a flamboyant raconteur who uh, wrote this book, which a book, the You Can Negotiate Anything, that was based on a profile on him in originally in Playboy magazine. This is around, I think, 1980. It became a book publishing phenomenon, bestseller list, frankly, all over the world. And he then became a, a, a fixer of, of disputes uh, around the world. He assisted presidents and boardrooms in negotiating hostage crises uh, uh, in, in the Iran hostage crisis for President Carter. He was involved in uh, 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 nuclear disarmament. Um, and it's really an extraordinary story, and it and it's told by his son, uh, who himself is a best-selling writer. Uh, if you haven't read Rich before, he's not just my friend. I am telling you, he's one of the great nonfiction writers in the United States, if not the best, and also the, one of the most entertaining and hilarious writers. Uh, he's had been a contributing uh, writer for Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair, and he's written books on an incredible number of topics. Some actually have some connections, uh, Jewish gangsters of the 1930s, uh, Jewish partisans during World War II fighting in uh, Lithuania, uh, the first gangster in the United States in the mid 19th century. He's an amazing sports writer also. He's written a book about the Chicago Bears and the Chicago Cubs. I suspect there's one about the Chicago Bulls somewhere in the future. He's written uh, an amazing family memoir other than this one called Sweet and Low, which we'll talk about. He's written about Pete coaching Pee Wee hockey, uh, youth sports and youth sports culture and how parents get involved in that. Uh, he's written one of my favorite books about uh, the Rolling Stones. Uh, and he wrote this other amazing book uh, about the birth of rock and roll in the recording industry, which I think, I think Rich will tell us, was the, was the inspiration for one of my favorite HBO shows that he co-created with Martin Scorsese and Mick Jagger. Yes, Mick Jagger, because remember, he wrote a book about the Rolling Stones, and the show was called Vinyl. Uh, I don't know how many seasons it ran, one or two, but it really was an amazing show. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it obviously originates somewhat out of that book uh, about the Chess Brothers. Um, this book is in many ways a, a personal literary memoir. Um, it's very much a, a tribute to a father and his mother. Uh, it's a self-help book in its own right, even though his father's book was a self-help book. It's a book about family feuds and the psychological complexity of families. Uh, and guess what? Uh, Larry King and Sandy Koufax, actual people, uh, have cameos here because, in fact, his father, uh, 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 Herbie Cohen, uh, was very much inspired in his negotiating strategies by his childhood growing up in Bensonhurst and his gang of fellow uh, Jewish lower middle class kids, among whom was Larry King and Sandy Koufax. The, group, the gang was called the Warriors. If Before we introduce uh, Rich, if you're watching us live on YouTube, we love having you. Go to folks.org at some place at some point tonight. Sign up for email updates uh, so you can find out about our future events. If you have a question for Rich, we'll hope to have, take some at the end tonight. Go to the Q&A box, type it in, send, send, and hopefully we'll get to talk to Rich Cohen. Rich, welcome again to Folks. Thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks for having me. Thanks for the really wonderful introduction. Well, it's very much deserved. Uh, this is now, I, I have all the Rich Cohen books at home, and this is now, I think, could possibly be either my first or second most favorite of them. This is <laughs> really great, Rich. It's a real, it's a real triumph. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, an anecdote I have that I don't think you know. 
Okay. Uh, it's my uh, Herbie Cohen anecdote, which is I was at your mother's funeral. You may not know this, uh, but I was there and I noticed it, before it started, I saw uh, Governor Mario Cuomo and Governor Andrew Cuomo at the time, Andrew Cuomo was the governor and Mario Cuomo was a former governor standing alone at the back. I don't know where the security detail was for <laughs> Andrew, but I, they were just in the back. So I walked over because Mario Cuomo has been a guest of ours twice. And I, I know uh, uh, Andrew as, as well. So I just walked up casually. They said ho hello, but they didn't, you know, I, I wasn't really included in the conversation. Spent the whole time before the funeral swapping Herbie Cohen anecdotes. <laughs> You know, it was really impressive. Like they yeah. both, they both <laughs> had so many anecdotes, and they were laughing, and they were talking about serious moments. <laughs> Clearly, he advised them as well. Uh, that was your dad, flamboyant and larger than life, right? Well, that is my father, and he has a big uh, impact on people and people who I kind of took it for granted when I was a kid. I had a friend of mine who I thought was the coolest kid in the world, and he asked me once why my father wasn't president. And I'm like, that would take, that would have to go through all the US history to explain why he's not president, but he's not president. That's why he's coaching our softball team. <laughs> you no, know, I, I, when I read the book, I think of it as a new twist on the greatest generation. It has a feel like that. It's not World War II. Korea war is in the backdrop. Uh, you're talking about a gang of kids who grew up uh, you know, listening to Frank Sinatra, uh, living in, in, in uh, Bensonhurst uh, in Brooklyn, uh, lower middle class, hanging out at street corners, uh, and the way it influenced them. And the leader of this gang just happened to be Herbie Cohen. And the book actually takes you through some incredible childhood experiences that you can see how he ended up becoming the world's greatest uh, uh, negotiator. Did you see this too? Um, did you romanticize this period? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you have this idea when you're a kid that the world is full of experts who went to colleges and academies and learned how to run everything. <laughs> and then I watched my father who got up to, you know, very close to the seat of power in this country. And, I, and he was an, and he is an expert on negotiation and conflict resolution. And everything he knew came from his experience as a kid on the street, in the army, and it's interesting because you say the greatest generation to me. He always said his generation was the was the, the generation that got skipped. They were the quiet oh. generation. They were the Korean War generation. They never. He always said they never had their president. And if you asked him who their president should have been, it would have been Mario Cuomo. You know that oh. was the Korean War generation. So, and my father grew up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. When he used to at, he used to say that the population of Bensonhurst was forty eight percent Jewish. 49% Italian, 3% other, <laughs> you know, so, and Cuomo very much came from his, that, his own version of that world. And he used to call it uh, Anatefka West. That was Bensonhurst. <laughs> and when you point out it was also very Italian, he would say it was also Calabria West, you know? <laughs> so, or, so, you know, and I grew up with these stories of his youth gang, which isn't like a gang, they called it a social athletic club called the Warriors. Mostly they played sports. But they, they, they had jackets, you know, they, they had, had jackets that would reverse the white, the inner lining would be wore outside for formal occasions, such as a wedding or a bar mitzvah or whatever. And then the <laughs> other one was for just hanging around. And he had this group of friends because when I, I grew up outside of Chicago and my friends were very normal, boring people. And his friends were like Inky, Puha, Gutter Rat, Shepo. <laughs> and I would meet these people later and they just seemed like regular people. But I'd heard these incredible stories. So, and my father's nickname when I was a kid was, he said his nickname had been Hans Somo. When I asked him why, he said it was because he was so goddamn good looking as a kid. And when I asked <laughs> him, my grandmother if it was true that they called him Hans Somo, he said, I know that's what he asked the boys to call him. So that's a big part of my father's philosophy, which is you can plant the seeds of your own legend and harvest it later. And that's but a you lot know, but well, let me just ask one, one funny thing about Italians of, of that neighborhood. There's a great line that, you know, the book is filled with aphorisms from that you picked up from your dad. And one of them is something like, at a certain point, Jews and Italians look exactly alike. Right. Well, it's <laughs> funny because my mother died. You were at my mother's funeral. And then my father lived in Florida, moved back to Brooklyn. Right. And he, you know, he had a new, a new group of friends and there were all these old Italian guys. 
they weren't the old Jewish guys. They were all, and he basically said at a certain age, they're, they're the same. They all yeah. become the same. So he's, I guess, at the, the, that age. And one of the things he does is he's a judge of the meatball eating contest at the San Janeiro <laughs> Festival, what? my father. So that's one of the things he's using yeah. his great negotiating skills. So from you know, negotiating with the Russians at the start talks to judging the meatball contest at the San Janeiro. I must tell you, though, when I read that line, in addition, in addition to it being hilarious, my first thought was the, our cultural moment now, where everyone is so obsessed with cultural misappropriation. You know, I'm friendly with John Turturro, who is, by the way, has been a guest of folks a number of times. And John often plays Jews. Right. right. O- oftentimes. And and, you know, Jews never seem to be upset by that. <laughs> They're actually happy that, you know, no, it's, it's, not, a, it's very, not uncommon for Italians to play the role of Jews. Very flattering. You know, my first book was Tough Jews, which began with my father and Larry telling these gangster stories about Brooklyn. Yeah. But it came out at the same time as uh, I think his name is Tom Cahill wrote a book, The Gift of the Jews. Yeah. And I was like, this is the best thing for a Jewish audience, which is a person who's not Jewish telling them how great they are. Like, it's not a cultural appropriation. It's like the biggest compliment. You yeah. Can have. Somebody I was cares thinking, enough to like get involved in this. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about um, in that show that you created for HBO Vinyl, Ray Romano plays a Jew. Right. Uh, in fact, if I remember, there's even a bat mitzvah scene. So th- it's very common. And I thought about Herbie Cohen saying, yeah, it it's completely makes sense. Let and me you read you James something. Khan playing, you know, Sonny Corleone. It goes both exactly. ways. Oh, great. Even better. <laughs> right. So let me read this from the book. Uh, Herbie believed he could talk his way into every kind of office, room, or situa- and situation. It was all about confidence. And it is astonishing in this book Rich, how many times he does that thing? He, yeah. you know, he speaks to a security guard, he gets himself in. And, and what's his thinking on that? That people are what, gullible? If you say it to them in a certain way, they won't question you? Or is it something about, since he's not here tonight, is there something about his mannerisms that he could tell you I'm the Prince of Wales? Well, and, he, and he has a Brooklyn accent and he says he's the Prince of Wales and says, your highness, please walk in. I think one of his things, he's he's like sort of a student of authority and uh-huh. he believes people are looking for some kind of authority to sort of follow because it takes the psychological, spiritual pressure off of them. And that doesn't have to be, it could be a person and it could be an, a sign. So, I mean, S-I-G-N. So right. like one of his big things was, you know, you can negotiate at a Sears for a dishwasher because you people don't because they see the big sign and they think it was put there by God. You know, and it's the same kind yeah. of thing, presenting yourself as authority. And he used to, I was at Barney, I had breakfast this morning at Barney Greengrass. Okay. And there was a sign on the bathroom door, handwritten sign that said, no water, bathrooms out of service. And 80% of the people saw the sign and left and 20% of the people ignored it and just went right in, you know? <laughs> and he used to tell a story. What, about, what would Harvey say about that? He would say. He would say that this sign is crap, man. Like, who wrote this sign? This is that guy. He doesn't want outsiders using his bathroom. Of course, there's water. They're using the sinks right there. So he's like a human version of that sign. Which is, and so there's a, a story where I didn't, which is, I never really know how to describe it. But when I was a kid, we went from Israel to Egypt This uh, on a vacation. And this was like a big deal because it was still sort of not that long yeah. after the peace treaty, it was a little scary. And it was jam packed, the airport full of people. There was like a two hour line to get through customs and you had to exchange like $500 a person and you weren't allowed to exchange it back. It was like a hustle. And my father disappeared and my mother freaked out, where's your father? And a couple of minutes later, he reappeared with a guy in a uniform and the guy said, diplomats, diplomats, diplomats and just waved us all through. <laughs> that's great. I love that. That's not even that's good for the folks audience because that's that one is not even in the book. And that, <laughs> is, that is really a great one. I love that. But that was so, like a head scratcher. Like, how did he do that? And he would yeah, never... You're saying what could he have possibly said? Right. Yeah. That somehow he, he act this guy convinced this guy he was an important diplomat. He had to be taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> so you've written about we've I've said this before. You just mentioned it too. Jewish mobsters, Jewish record executives. I mentioned you wrote about the banana King, uh, who was a Jewish guy from also the United States that sort of cornered the market in Latin America on bananas. You wrote about, you wrote with Jerry Weintraub, a, a, an autobiography of the, he's very, very well known 
movie uh, mogul slash producer, you seem to have, and it's, I'm wondering, is it just because of your dad or because of your relationship to Larry King? But you do have an admiration and a uh, sort of a knowing sense of Jewish street guys, fast talking, street smart, uh, people who see through bullshit and take no crap. Uh, you know, the Yiddish word for the machers, people that make, uh -huh. make it in such a way that they become in charge. A little rough, not Ivy League educated, especially not Ivy League educated, uh, filled with a sense of chutzpah and a sense of wonder and that anything is possible because you make this story in the book as well. You know, Larry King's story is ridiculous, right? I right. mean, a lot of these stories. And also, I love that anecdote that you say that when your father was friendly as a boy with Sandy Koufax, who many people still believe is the best picture that's ever played in the major leagues, he was known as a, bas as a basketball player. He had a best jump shot in Brooklyn. I don't, did he, he didn't even play? I mean, it's so improbable to me that when, he, when your dad went to Korea, the next thing we hear is that, that uh, Sandy Koufax is playing for the Dodgers. Right. Well, Larry used to tell the story when he first played, Koufax first played for the Dodgers, they would go to Ebbets Field and lean over the dugout and try to give him these matzah sandwiches. And Koufax, who was young, early in his career and not playing very much, was embarrassed. And the other Yankees, like Jackie Robinson and Pee Wee Reese, would reach up and take the sandwiches and very happily eat them as Koufax <laughs> turned. The stories I heard. But the story I always heard is he was a great basketball player and they played at the Jewish Community House in Bensonhurst. They had this famous coach, Coach Gold. They had a, a all-star team there. And the Knicks came out and played like a charity game. And Koufax dominated the Knicks yeah, center. You, it's in the them. book. I yeah. love that. I love that anecdote. He and owned them. And his career was shortened, Koufax, because he hurt his, he had a bad elbow, I think, an arthritic elbow. And my father always maintained that that was not hurt playing baseball. It was hurt playing basketball in Brooklyn, where it was, a, it was like playground rules. And he went over somebody and the guy pushed him into the wow. stanchion and he messed up his elbow. And so that's this, really, it's not like he learned to throw a curveball too late in life. No, well, the story is, so he went to university of Cincinnati, I think, which is a great basketball program. If you know basketball or Oscar Robertson. Isn't that Oscar Rob? Right. Oscar yeah. Robertson. And he was on a basketball scholarship and he went and he saw that this baseball team was going for spring training down to Florida. And he tried out for the baseball team because he wanted the free trip to Florida. <laughs> and it turned out that just throwing the baseball, he's throwing the baseball like, you know, close to 100 miles an hour. It's an amazing story. But again, yeah. it goes to this idea that's in your book that these guys, you know, these real like street <laughs> kids, you know, in the end did not feel they were undeterrable. You know, they well, felt that anything truly was pos possible and chutzpah made sense. I mean, the story about, you know, I can't believe the story about Koufax. We know how improbable that is. Because you, you know, normally we think of kids learning how to pitch throughout little league, right? Right. And this guy becomes the greatest pitcher that starts so late. So I'm wondering what you are clearly. Um, is it that you know these guys, or you're just sort of fascinated oh. by them? Because the Jewish mobster book, the partisans book, the Banana King book, uh, that, and now Herbie Cohen joins the ranks of these. Well, style. I feel like part of it is I know these people and like the reason I felt like I could write about Jerry Weintraub as Jerry Weintraub, because mm -hmm. it was we wrote it together and I yeah. wrote as Jerry was because he's so much like my father and they became friendly when I was writing the book. Oh, wow. He would say stuff, you know, just like my father, same kind of sense of humor. And um, so I felt like I always hear that voice in my head anyway. And also because the st stereotype or the, the image you got of Jews in the popular culture then was so different than the people that I knew that it bothered me, you know, and I wanted to present these people that I actually knew, you know? Right. So, and it was interesting because I felt like they're very, very interesting people. And my father, you know, he wrote this gigantic bestseller and everything, but he's ultimately a storyteller. Right. And it's all about, intonation voices you know that was one of the weird things which and that's also in his book right that many ways it's not a it's not like written like a business book no it's written like the, you really learn how to negotiate and he does it by telling stories and he has a simple philosophy which he, I would think he the most simple storytelling which is like Aesop where there's yeah. a problem there's a story it's also very Jewish in a way yeah it's like Jesus with the parable 
examples, man. It's like a story and then you discuss what the story means and that's how you learn the thing. And the stories would just be about very earthy street things. And it's all was around his philosophy, yeah. which was kind of about empowering the weak or people who perceived as weak, which were his own parents who were immigrants from Europe and uneducated and Yiddish speakers. And he always said, you know, the secret to life is to care, but not that much. <laughs> Approach your life as, as if it were a game. Mm. Look at it as a game. He always said to me about like things you buy, you're, no one owns anything. We all just rent. You know, it's all going back to the owner at the end. And basically the, the, the phrase that came out of his book was power is based on perception. If you think you got it, even if you don't, if, if you think you got it, even if you don't got it, you got it. Wow. But basically. Wow. So, so that was his idea, which is how do you, that you always have power, even if you don't know it. And when I was a kid, people were afraid of negotiating. It wasn't a word people use. It was an intimidating, scary thing. And he sort of said, look, you're negotiating all the time in your regular life. You don't call it that, but that's what it is. It's how we sort of function in the world. And he he must have realized this young. I'm going to ask you if you can tell a shortened version of the Mapo story. You know, for people who were Larry King fans, Larry King told this Mapo story many times. And I think, as you've pointed out, he tells it in 30 minutes. And you're, hopefully you'll tell a very, 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 very abbreviated version of it. But it's very telling. And it gives you a sense of what your father, even as a kid, was able to do and how he carried like this anecdote into the rest of his life. So right. go ahead, Rich. Well, there, see, so a very big thing about my father's stories is when I was a kid, I'd list, at night I'd turn on the radio and Larry had this amazing radio show, which people don't remember, on every night from midnight till 5 a.m. And at, he'd have a guest for an hour, then tell stories. And he told these stories about my father. And he did the same accents when telling them that my father- No, it's very did. important that people understand this is pre-CNN Larry right. King, right? So Larry King was plucked by Ted Turner when CNN started. But before that, he was a radio guy. And a great one. And a really great one, right. And he so, had these talk shows. He did all sorts of things. Um, he started out of Miami Beach. But you're describing something that was truly a national show. Right. That the whole country was listening to, but literally in the wee hours of the evening. Right. And it had a very good listenership. and and so. He told the story about my father, where he always said this was the origin of Herbie Cohen, the negotiator, which was they were going to school one day, I think in ninth grade, and a friend <laughs> of theirs called Mapo. That's what they called him. His name was Gil Mermelstein. Because of his hair, they called him Mapo. My father, Larry, and a guy named Buzzy. I always get the names a little confused. They went over to his house to pick him up to walk to school. His house was all shut down. His cousin was there, and they said, What's up? He said, Mapo has tuberculosis and he's been sent to Arizona for the treatment. I'm just here to shut the house, go to the school and get his records transferred for a tutors he's going to be taking in Arizona. My father said, don't worry about it. Go about your business. We will tell the school. And on the way to school, my father said to Larry and Buzzy, I've got a great idea, a great way to make some money to go to Nathan's with. He said, we'll go to the school and we'll tell them that Mapo died. Mapo's dead. And we'll raise money for a funeral week. And they're like, we're going to get in trouble. They're like, listen, by the time Mapo gets back, we will have graduated. They're going into high school in 10th grade then. And we're going to be out of the jurisdiction of that. No one's ever going to find out. No one's going to remember. So they actually, my father has a slightly different origin of how he ended up doing this. But they actually went to the school, to the front office. They said Mapo was dead. They went around and they raised all this money and they spent the money at Nathan's planned perfectly. <laughs> then at the end of the year, they get called in and Buzzy and Larry, they're all together, like freaking out. They found out we're in trouble. And instead, the, the school decided they wanted to start an award at the school and they were going to call it the Gil Mermelstein Memorial Award. <laughs> and in, first, honor, in, in honor, in honor of the Mapo. boy that died. Right. Mapo and the first the winner of that award was going to be my dad, Larry and Buzzy for raising this money for the funeral wreath. Big assembly. They're going to invite the press. And uh, there was actually a New York Times reporter there. Yes, the New York Times reporter went. And as Larry would tell it, in the most amazing uh, recovery in tubercular history, <laughs> Mapo is recovered and he returns to school that day. He and just he goes, walks in. Right, he walks in, the school's empty because everyone's at the assembly. He doesn't know what's going on. He's nervous. He goes to the front office. They don't know who he is. They say there's an assembly. Mapo has a choice. He can go in the side door where nobody would notice him or outside and in the big front doors of the theater with the big clanking doors. He chooses that dramatic way. 
The kids in the back of the room look, they see him, they know who he is. They instantly know what my father has done and Larry has done, and they start to laugh. And the laughter spreads from the back. There's like a thousand kids in there, all the way to the front, to the stage where the principal's got his reading glasses on. He's reading this thing, honoring my father and Larry and Buzzy. And he doesn't know who, he looks up, he's totally confused. And my father sees what goes on and he stands up and he yells, go home, Mapo, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> and Mapo turns and runs. And Larry's story is about they were gonna get expelled from the school and they're in huge trouble. And the Times reporter was there and they went into the principal's office and the principal gave this big speech to them about how they were being kicked out. They were never gonna graduate, never play sports, never do any of this. And Larry and Buzzy are like crying. And my father said, hold on, think about this for a second. We're in trouble, but you're in even bigger trouble. He's speaking to the principal. Yeah. And this is my father's whole thing, like about negotiating this radical empathy. So he quote, uh, paraphrase Arthur Miller, to understand the price you have to understand the player. Look at it from his point of view. He's like, yes, we're never going to graduate and we're never going to go to school again, but you're never going to teach again. You're never going to have a job again. He said, we're three people with a history of bad behavior. We come in and we tell you a kid is dead. And all you do is call the house, get a disconnected phone line and write deceased on his card. And that's it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, we're, we're never graduating, but you're never working again. And the principal, Larry said the principal was utterly whipped and just said, let's just forget the whole thing. Just graduate and get and, out of here. And this is a ninth grader or an eighth right. grader. Right. And it's then amazing. they go talk to the Times reporter who's there and laughing. So, and so I'll tell you how much Larry loved this story. Uh, we had him as a guest years ago. Uh, and uh, after the event, it was live. I took him to dinner somewhere on Upper Broadway. And of course, you know, when you walk in with him, it's like way bigger than like, you know, it was very strange, frankly, Rich, because because of the way he looks, everyone noticed him. It wasn't even like Michelle Pfeiffer. She would have had a better time going into the restaurant. Everyone turned. And so we got a table in the back. And at one point I told him about this documentary that I was uh, working on about Sidney Lumet and we needed financing. And so he said, well, why don't you just just call up Al Pacino and ask him? Because Al Pacino's career was so much made by Serpico and Dog Day Afternoon. So I said, well, I, yeah, I know I've been thinking about it. He said, let's call him right now. And he takes out his cell phone. He calls Al Pacino. I mean, this is a great Larry King story. He calls, he said, Al, hi, this is Larry King. You know, I have a professor here who needs to talk to you. He hands me the phone. I am not ready for this, Rich. Right. I, I, and I don't do this. You know, this is not my, I, this is not me. I'm not your dad. I take the phone. Uh, hi, hi, Mr. Pacino. And I stammering the whole way. And Larry's telling me what to say. And at one point, he, Larry is so frustrated with me that he literally says, tell him you're sick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he, clearly, when I read the book, I went, oh, my God, he was doing the Mapo story. He wanted but that's to how I mean, that's how him and my father always were. So one of the great things about having them around is they love baseball and they always get me to go out on the field. You know, and I, I they took me to this Cracker Jack old timers game where I met like Joe DiMaggio. And I mean, it was unbelievable who was at that game. And they were always just very excited to talk to these people. One of Larry's stories, which is not in the book, is my father and Larry went to a Dodgers game uh, with the Police Athletic League. Like, cause, you know, and they brought him there and they got to meet a pitcher and the pitcher was explaining how to throw a curveball, Billy Pearson or something. And my dad, Larry, to his sister, said, excuse me, Billy, you're throwing your curveball incorrectly. <laughs> and, <laughs> And then he goes, what you, and my dad showed me, he goes, actually, the kid is right. I am actually throwing it incorrectly. <laughs> That's so great. So your father in, literally invented, and it comes across in the book, the, a win-win situation. Where everyone, you, you, everyone uses that term of art now, but what does it tell us what it really means? Well, it was sort of, he, he kind of repurposed the term from game theory, which had been like lose, lose, you know, like different, you know, yeah. algorithm, uh, lose, win, win, lose, win, win. Right, permutations. Right. right, and he sort of thought he kind of made it a, a common phrase and it was was a phrase of his business because one of the things people think when they negotiate, because when I went back and read his book again, I mean, when he wrote it, he read it to us out loud. I've read it many times. And back, this is like 1980, right? Yeah, but it's a deeply profound book that is on the surface about business, but really about life. For him, right. everything that's important is about life. And it's about how to live a good life and how to treat people well 
and also be successful. And his whole thing is, if the other side doesn't win, you can't win. Both sides have to win. So there's so much of negotiation where you think, I don't win unless that person loses. That's a zero-sum game. Right. You're just sowing the seeds for eventual failure. Well, also, I think he, you say in the book that if you do it in a zero-sum way, it's possible the deal will eventually fall through because the losing side will simply not accept it. Right. They'll look for a way out. And right. another weird thing that I learned firsthand where he'd been saying this whole his whole life, and I never believed him, was never give the asking price. And his thing is not because you're cheap or you want to save money. If you want to have a deal that works. And a couple of years ago, we were in a big problem with a house and we needed a house and we offered the asking price. And he goes, don't do that. You won't get that house. And you're like, great. I'm like, you don't understand the market. The world's changed. You're 85 years old. I, I offered the asking price and the deal, they counter offered on their own asking price and the deal fell through. He's like, when you offer the asking price, they don't think, oh, great. We got what we wanted. They think, oh no, we didn't ask for enough. Right, we got, we're too low. Right. So you got to make them think like they set a good price and it was a struggle for you and then the deal will stick. So all the negotiating stuff, which is a hassle, is part of a ritual that has a reason so everybody can feel like they've come away getting the most they can get. So here, here's a, there's an irony in this Cohen family. There are many. Uh, one of your books, this book on sweet and low, it just so happens your grandfather on your mother's side invented sweet and low. Right. And, and that book is great. I don't know if you remember, we did an event years ago in which we discussed that book. And that book is really great because it, it really is about a family feud because that side of the family, except your mother, who is essentially disinherited, were, were fabulously wealthy because this is when Sweet and Low ended up becoming something that wasn't just at diners, but you could go get them at, you know, at, uh, at grocery stores. And that made your grandfather on your mother's side fabulously wealthy. Um, I'm first, so that story itself was so remarkable when you wrote it. And I'm wondering, what is it about the Coens and the, you know, the other side of the Coens that is so entertaining, so bittersweet? I'm sorry for the pun, uh, but bittersweet that there's something about that it does seem like your family has a wellspring of funny, entertaining, tragic characters that are in many ways larger than life, that do things that are larger than life. You know, you describe your grandfather as a tinkerer, an inventor who came up with this great idea about dieting, right? He wanted, he wanted to look better and he decided, you know what, I'm going to invent something that will allow me to eat my cake <laughs> and, right. not, and not gain weight and right. eat it. Right. So what is it about, the, this is extraordinary. And it's also what a, what a fortune for you to be a, a writer growing right. up in this family. Well, I think part of it is that there, you know, it's like how you look at it. A lot of families have super interesting things, but there's so much part of your life. You don't step back and look at it. And one of the things my mother was disinherited and we were disinherited. And I always thought like being disinherited, the good thing about it is I'm completely free, you know, to recognize and see and tell the story for what it was. And what I, like Sam Zimuri, who I wrote about, was a very similar to guy to my grandfather. I feel like there were these types of people around who worked really, really hard, were really strong in one part of their life and really not strong in another. But what my grandfather did that was sort of fits as a writer, I think I got from was, he recognized that if he had something that was bothering him, it wasn't him alone. There'd be millions of other people. And what bothered him was he always wanted to lose weight and it was before he invented sweet and low, there was these cyclamate tablets, but his whole thing was you couldn't put them on your strawberries. He wanted something he could put on his strawberries <laughs> and it didn't exist. So he invented it and figuring if I want it, a lot of other people probably want it too, even if they don't know it. And as a writer, you do the same thing. You think if it's interesting to me, yeah. it's probably interesting hmm. to a lot of other people because not because I'm special, but because I'm basically completely average. But, you know. but you know, what's interesting about that story and something else you tell in the book about your father's book, uh, You Can Negotiate Anything, is, and this is the psychological complexity that I want you to address. Your father actually was involved in two major lawsuits in which he may not, and as you point out, he may not have taken his own advice, which he's cared about it too much and was very emotional. It's literally out of The Godfather, you know, where, you know, it's not personal, Sonny, it's business. Right. right. But it does seem like Herbie Cohen took two things personally. The f one was your, his wife being disinherited from the 
from this uh, uh, fortune for sweet and low. And secondly, he was sued by a few academics who claim that they had the original idea for your father's book. And your father, right. his own publisher said, just settle. And right. on pr principle alone, your father eventually won because it, he did, was able to prove that he actually had notes from long before when the book was written that spoke about these themes. And these two or three academics came after him. And if anything, they stole from him. Right. But it, it ended up diminishing his own fortune. And then he did the same thing with your mother being disinherited. One of the things that he said, and I want you to address this is, it's like he didn't take his own advice because he had another schoolyard principle that seemed to be more important, which is you don't let the bully take advantage of you, right? Right. That the bully will only come back again. And he saw those two lawsuits as bullies and he was willing to literally spend, you know, your inheritance <laughs> right. to vindicate those rights. How do you explain this? Well, first of all, for whatever reason, you know, my father did very well in his career, made a lot of money, but he never cared about money. I never felt like he cared about money. His attitude is always, you could always make more money. Doesn't matter. You can make the money back. You make the money again. You know, that, so what the thing that bothered me about the lawsuit, especially with the book thing, is that it was the time, how much time he spent. I it. see. You know, so, because you can never get the time back. You get the money back. And um, the fact is that I knew that that book, that those ideas were his, because half of them were stories about us. We lived through it. it he opens the book with a story about me. Yeah. At a restaurant having a te temper tantrum, basically. So I knew that that obviously didn't steal it. I remembered it. It happened to me. So, um, but the thing is, like, you're right. He feels, always feels like you got to stand up to a bully and that this person's going around hurting people and you got to stop them. And not only will they come back to you, they'll go after other people. And now they're going to kind of like be stopped. And you're going to kind of clean up the garden of the world a little bit by dealing with them. But, but also, it, but also, Rich, it's a, it's another street corner vision of the world it right. came it came from that area right that whole experience of growing up on a street corner right and the idea is that you know you pick the wrong guy to to, to mess with now i also will say because my father's book is at heart in some ways a self-help book and i have learned from him and from other people that the people who write self-help books are the ones most in need of self-help that's yeah, why they write the book. You, you mentioned that in the book. Yeah, best they're part. like, you know, talking to themselves at the night. So my father knew philosophically what he should do, but he got emotionally involved in that like he would as a kid with a guy trying to bully him and take something that was his. And uh, the other thing is he always said, though, in the you can negotiate anything that you the worst person you can negotiate for is yourself. So he knew it. He said, because you get too emotional, you get too attached, you have to be detached, you have to care, but not that much. And when you're negotiating for yourself, or in this case, making legal decisions for yourself, you care too much. You know, so ultimately it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory because he won, but it, it ate up a lot of time. So your father is still alive. He's obviously proud of this best-selling New York Times writing uh, 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 author, uh, but he must have been charting your career and saying, wait a minute, he's writing about Jewish gangsters and how much he admired them. Uh -huh. He's writing about Jewish partisans and how much he admired them. He's writing about a Jewish uh, banana king, uh, wholesaler of bananas, and he admired him. He wrote about, he wrote with Jerry Weintraub, a street kid gone Hollywood. Uh, and he wrote about record executives, Jews, who essentially rec invented the record business for rock and roll. Uh, I gotta be in this pipeline. At right. some point, did he think clearly the Rich Cohen pipeline is going to have to include me. Was that ever, and whatever happened here, did you interview him or did he cooperate? Did you end up taking notes as a kid and you had everything already in your head? Well, I think first of all, m more interested in my subject matter, he was interested in my career choices. So mostly he thought being a writer was basically stupid, <laughs> that you couldn't make a living doing it. He always had a list of stupid careers. Number one was professional ballet dancer. And number two was professional writer. It's stupid. He never really did it. He's, and he always, that's why he was trying to get me to go to law school. Right. I think it's important that you remind the audience, he didn't really do it because although he was an internationally best-selling writer, he was also literally flying around the globe 
negotiating high stakes disputes, conflict resolution, right. for which he received giant fees. Well, so, he would say he took a minuscule percentage of an astronomical sum. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but so that, so I don't think he really thought so much about subject matter, but I do know that when I, when my, I, when I wrote about Jerry Weintraub, because he was so much, and before I wrote the book, I wrote a Vanity Fair story about him. He said, why don't you, my mother really wanted me to write a book about my father. Okay. And also. So this um, literally comes from your mom, the original idea. Well, yes. And also I wrote, written a story about Larry too, that appeared in Rolling Stone like a profile of Larry, where I hung out with Larry, where he played nude volleyball at La Costa in uh, the West Coast. I found out, fortunately, when I got there, it was actually in the pool. Because when I pictured it, <laughs> yeah. I pictured out on the dry ground, a bunch of nude old guys. But then it turned out it was in the pool, but every now and then somebody would go up for a spike. So that's a big problem. <laughs> but so- By the way, I, I never read that. Was Did you actually talk about that in the Rolling Stone piece? Yeah, oh yeah. That's in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where we were. We were at La Costa for like a week. And, you know, I and weird because I knew Larry my whole life, but then I kind of interviewed him in some right, way. So, right. so anyway, um, so and then my father appears as a character. I've written about him in my different books because he has such a big influence, so important to me. I admired him, admire him so much and learned so much from him how to read other people. Because I always think at heart, my father is like a novelist and that his secret of negotiation is paying attention to other people, listening to what they say. Don't talk over people. Don't pretend to be smart. Pretend to be dumb. Mm -hmm. Pretend to be dumb. I love that part in the book. Yeah. That, that you, people actually benefit smart. from saying, what's the line? Can you help me? Yeah, I don't know. Can you please help me? Yeah. And people will help you. That's what he yes. said. And dumb is better than smart and inarticulate is better than know-it-all, mm -hmm. you know, in any kind of negotiation or meeting. And it's good for a reporter too, by the way. Hmm. So I felt like, you know, so I was writing about him all along. When I came to write this actual book, um, there was a period early on when I tried to actually call him and get him to tell me some of his stories. But I, his story, he would his stories were what he wanted to talk about, not what I wanted. You know, it was like, and I'd heard all these stories. So at some point, when I decided to write it, I had to just write it from my point of view. I see. And as I lived it, you know, and um, he has a thing that he always lives by, which is we see things not as they are but as we are. So I very much had the sense that this was my version of the story. You know, it, it, my brother or sister told it it would be different. I'm, but, the, but, I'm the youngest and I'm a right. lot younger and I grew up in a different kind of household. Right. Like that lawsuit, which you mentioned, was going on. While you were there. For, that was like probably three years, but it was three years that I was in high school. Right. And three years when you're in high school seemed like an eternity. Which is why you said earlier, he, it took him away. Which yeah. was well, it's not so much the money spent on legal fees. It was the, um, the time spent with right. Rich. And, he, and his response to it stress-wise was to work. Right. To work almost seven days a week for three years. You know, you didn't see him. He just was mm. traveling, working his ass off. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, um, yeah, this, the story is, just, uh, it's in, in some ways, it's just so poignant and, there are moments of heartbreak. And I would say that when you said before about how he said, you know, uh, you know, his book was really about life. And you tell this anecdote that he had said to you once that I'd remember the Sinatra song that yeah. was purportedly about baseball, but Herbie said to you, you know, Rich, the song is purports to be about baseball, but it's really about life. And then, you know, his book, best-selling book was really about life, but I must say, Rich, when I read this as your friend and reader for so many years, I actually thought this book was also about you. Yeah, I mean, I, sure. I, yeah. I really do. It was, I, I, I saw a lot of you in this in a way that I hadn't seen in some of the other books. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a tribute to him, but it was also, uh, you know, a, a glimpse into what it was like to be his son uh, and your relationship with him and your mother and your brother and sister. And it really... So I wonder, is this, would you say, if someone, if your editor said to you, Rich, you know, it's time for you to write a literary memoir of your own, would you say, you know what, I kind of think I did when I wrote about my father? Or do you think, you know, one thing about these Coens, the stories are endless and there's, there's, there's a lot more that could have been said. This was merely a taste of Rich Cohen in a personal memoir. I mean, I'm still living and things are still happening to me, but I think like when I first started 
my first job was at the New Yorker as a messenger. And I started reading those old nonfiction writers like AJ Liebling and Joseph Mitchell and all those people. What I liked about them is those stories weren't about them, but they were only about them. If that makes sense. Yeah. By, by their voice, by the way they talk, by their sensibility, by their word choice, by what they noticed and what they enjoy. And so I think that all my books have been about me, you know, and my, I think this book, I think it's my best book because it's like the source code of where I learned everything. <laughs> I learned about the world from my That's mother great. and my father, you know, and my, my, I'm much closer in sensibility to my mother, which is why, you know, I sort of like, I'm fascinated by my father because some of it amazes me. I couldn't do it. I wouldn't try to do it. I'm terrible at negotiating. My mother hated it. We get embarrassed. We don't want to draw that kind of attention to ourselves. And I realized for him, he does it because it's fun. It's like a game. His way of interacting with the world is to sort of mix it up, you know? So I do think that this book is about me mm -hmm. and, and it's sort of about me reflected through them. I also think that the book is, that's why I said before, it's also about your mother. Yeah. Uh, there, it, 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 it was impossible to tell Herbie's story without her. Uh, and it was also, you were very, um, it's like, you know where your mom comes from. And you also seemed what, I like what you said before about, you know, I felt closer in some ways in temperament to her because there was an enormous sympathy for your mom in this book. You know, I think you really uh, make the reader incredibly sympathetic to your mother's story. Uh, the whole arc of it, the sweep of it. Um, it is and in some ways, although she's sort of the second banana in this uh, memoir, she's really present, you know, she's not a walk on, you know, she's really, right. you really, I think, get her in this book in a lot of ways that don't just reflect on your father, but also reflects on her in dealing with everything about her yeah. life. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something from the book. And this says something about what I said before about you being such a great writer about sports. This comes from uh, when your father uh, is, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. In, when he's in Korea, he's a, he spends the whole time when he's in the Korean War, not in Korea, but in Europe, coaching basketball, army teams of battalions and legions of, and this is literally, he's wearing a suit the whole time. Right. He's not wearing a uniform because he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a very young basketball coach who generals call to, they bring him in. He was a player in his own unit, but they realize he's a very smart player and he, he draws up plays and he's an unbelievably successful basketball coach of the American military. And here's, uh, you write, the ref blew the whistle and made the toss. Going after it, the players hung in the air for what felt like an eternity, their arms reaching for a ball that lingered between ascent and descent. The crowd, the noise, teammates waiting, coaches prowling, the hardwood shine, all of it frozen in a photographer's magnesium flare. <laughs> That's a restaurant quality sentence paragraph, Rich. Well, I'm trying to like, as hard as I can, think my way into his past, you mm -hmm. know? And right, the fact because that, he, never, he never described that, right? Like he right, never but I'll tell you, he told the stories and the stories were always by way of lessons. Like, since his whole thing was about again, basketball, again, about life, which is how do you beat a great team with a mediocre team? Right, right. And he'd say, it can be done. This is his whole thing. The one side's weak, one side's strong. The weak can beat the strong if they're smarter. And he would tell all these crazy, funny basketball stories. And I kind of took it with a grain of salt because my father didn't look like an athlete or a coach to me when I was a kid. And then I found this old scrapbook that he had kept. And it was all the stuff, all the stories he had told me had been written about in uh, Stars and Stripes. And there wow. were pictures. Right. Well, that, and some of them are actually even in the book. Yeah. And there are pictures and like that would be me intensely describing a picture of one of these moments of a tip off of one of these games and trying to like sort of put myself into that because it's where I wanted to be, man. I wanted to be friends with my father when we were both kids because yeah. he didn't seem like the funnest kid to be friends with. <laughs> my friend seemed sort of OK. And then later on, I don't know if you know this, but he would go on Larry all the time and talk about world events negotiation on his radio show. And my dad and Larry did this thing called Gork from the Planet Fringus. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I do remember that. It's they in the book. Ramble my father's voice, and he was said to be 
on, on another planet called planet Fringus. That was, it was ridiculous. 30 <laughs> days ahead of earth. Yeah. So he could look down and tell you, it wasn't like a fortune teller and tell you what was going to happen. He could already see it happen <laughs> because of the theory of relativity. He was ahead and right. people believed it. Yeah. And people would call in and he would tell, and then he got started hating doing it when he realized people would believe it. But this voice scrambled little alien had a very thick Brooklyn accent. <laughs> Oddly enough. <laughs> but it, it was like for you still running the people that knew Gork yeah. from Planet Fringus. Wow. Um, do the warriors, and I'm asking you as a Jewish writer, as a person who's written about uh, Jewish experiences, especially what I would argue exciting and cool ones in particular. Um, and you're also a father of four boys. Uh, you wrote a book about Israel. Do the warriors exist in any way? Or is that world of the shtetl and the corners of Bensonhurst of lower middle-class Jewish life, is that just simply gone? In the parlance of modern culture, are Jews today simply white privileged? They're indistinguishable from white people. The, the essence of what you wrote about, whether it was the Avengers, or yeah. whether it was tough Jews and now in and the banana king and Larry and Weintraub and now Herbie Cohen. Is that still around? Is it can you find remnants of it like in Boca? Is it somewhere? Uh, I don't think it's a, I think the Jews in America live the American dream to the extent that they assimilated in a sense so much that they kind of disappeared from existence, you know, as as in the way that you've described them in prior books. Right. They, I mean, they simply don't my, exist anymore. Not like that, which is a shame. Uh, there's good and there's bad sides of it, you know. But even in Chicago, where I grew up, that's why I loved Sal Bellow, because Sal Bellow was writing about these same guys in Chicago. And right. I, they're recognizable because they were some of my friend's fathers. And he was writing in that language, the way they spoke and turning it into kind of poetry. You, you mean know? like Augie March in particular? Yeah, yeah. or even like Humboldt Skift. He's Humboldt got, Skift, it, yeah. yeah. And Augie March, he's got the, you know, the pool hall owner and the wheelchair. Of course, yeah, yeah, of course. So. Or that yeah. book on Billy Rose, which you must yeah. have liked. The yes. Bella Rose. Yeah. yeah, it's like a long short story. Almost. Yeah, the novella, the Bella Rosa yeah. connection, yeah. I think. So I feel like those guys were a product. They were a unique product of that. They're like, at least for my father, his parents were immigrants. They didn't speak English was a second language. They worked very hard and they kind of, it was like Europe in their apartments and America out on the streets. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, there was people were really together in a way that I kind of would always envy because I felt kind of in the suburbs and especially my father was away working all the time. I felt kind of alone, mm -hmm. you know, and they felt, it seemed like they were never alone. Right. You know? Right. You always wanted oh. to be like a group of friends together all the time. It just seemed like heaven to me. So this book, which in so many ways is I think a, a Valentine to Jewish street kids of a particular era of your parents' generation. Um, I looked at it as, a, a, in some ways, given what you just said, like a lamentation, like a longing, a nostalgic look at something. As you said, you know, it wasn't your childhood and it certainly doesn't look like the childhood of your four boys now, right? right? So I'm wondering, and I wanna take you back to something that was in Tough Jews. And I remembered you talked about it uh, I don't even know if we knew each other at the time when you were on Larry King's show when that book first came out. I don't think I had yet met you. I think I met you at a writer's festival sometime after that. Yeah. Uh, but but you said something on Larry King and it's in the book and it is something, it is a quote that keeps coming back and I want to bring it back one more time where you talk about tough Jews, the gangsters of the 1930s, Murder Incorporated, Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, right? And you said something like, you know, they're not around anymore and I wish they were. Right. There was something where you said, I, I don't have the right quote, yeah. but you said, and you don't just say wish, you literally said something <laughs> like, we would be better off today. <laughs> and I remember thinking, the balls on that guy. You know, like, what is, he's, saying, he's saying, he's saying bring back murder and corporate, you know, <laughs> no, not the Jewish investment bankers, right. you know, not the Jews in Hollywood. No, the guys that, you know, the guys like uh, in The Godfather, right. you know, who, who, who are, you know, playing that role. In, yeah. uh, what is, what's the guy's name in Godfather One, who's the big Hyman Bugsy, Roth. Hyman Roth and the Bugsy Siegel got name. Oh, ben, Mo Green. 
Mo Green, of course, yeah. that era of Jewish gangster, bring them back. And I'm wondering whether it's true that you do have, it's more, it's a nostalgic longing to see these guys. And, to, and you think in some ways, Jewish Americans were better when we were had them. Look, I felt then like from where I grew up, where I came from, and it's like you live in a big reef. And when you have a big reef, you want there to be every different kind of fish, man. You want the big fish, little fish, the fish that's under the rock, the stingray, the shark going by over the top. You want the whole thing. You want the whole <laughs> ecosystem. And when I grew up, we only had a couple kinds of fish. And that's what I meant. Like, I want I those sharks back. I want the reef. I want the whole thing. And then when the, the sort of Jewish stereotypes were like Jews do, I, there was a Jews do a certain kind of thing. And if there's a Jewish criminal, that's going to be a white collar criminal, you know, <laughs> and it was funny and everything. But I sort of thought if this is preordained or whatever, that I'm going to live this certain kind of life because of how I was born, then my choice to do the right thing and to be a good guy has no meaning. Hmm. You know, and I always fell back on this Chaim Weitzman quote, I think, where he said, when we have Jewish cops chasing Jewish criminals, then you'll know that Israel's a success. Right. He was the first president of Israel. And I'm like, yeah, me and Chaim Weitzman, we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. Like people got mad at me like, because I get I have I'm closer to him. Him and me are closer sensibility wise than the modern leaders of Israel say. I get Chaim Weitzman. What he is saying is he wants the whole reef. He wants the panoply of human possibility for Jews. And that's what I meant about the gangsters. Not that we should go around, but that you should have this diversity of fates out there as examples makes for a more interesting life. Rich, I also thought, and I can't help but bring you back to what you said before about it. It also fits Herbie's view of the world uh, because of this, you know, don't don't let the bully get away with something. Right. And so there is something about the guys that wore these jackets on the street corners who left the street corner and went off into the world, but had a sense of, but we're not going to be shaken down. You yeah. know, we're not going to be taken advantage of. And, you know, we may not get into Caltech, but we're also not going to be the guy that's going to stand around and let the rabbi be beaten up across right. the street. I, I, I've said this in some of my own writings, you know, uh, in, the, in this past year, there's been a revival of anti-Semitism uh, around the country. Uh, it doesn't seem like progressives seem to care very much about that. Uh, it seems like Jews are in some ways rushing to continue to demonstrate their progressive bona fides. But I don't see, you know, the same kind of intensity about what do we do when rabbis in Williamsburg, Brooklyn are getting beaten up on right. the streets? Because and it's so, further in the past. You know, my father's whole family got wiped out except for the one cousin who became a partisan. And his lesson from that was, and he wasn't a little, he was like, you know, middle schooler when, when he was the people who, the woman who fought is alive, you know, uh -huh. and, and she was just, she's my cousin, you know. And uh, my father would say this thing when he'd get worked up about something, which I didn't put in this book because it makes him sound slightly nuts, but I knew what he meant. Would he always say, I'd say, why do you care so much about this? He'd say, because this is 1944 and this bastard is killing Jews. That wow. was basically how he'd always, you know, return everything about you got to fight. And I had a fight with, uh, I got into a, a argument with the teacher in school. It's in college. It's in the book. Yeah. And he took over this fight and went crazy, I thought. And I think it continued even after you graduated. After I graduated. And then he had this heart issue. And, and I thought this thing might have added to the stress. And I said, I, I hope now you realize how stupid this was. He goes, no. And in fact, your brother has been briefed on everything. And if I should fall, <laughs> he will continue. Okay. Which makes sense because your brother apparently assisted him in the sweet and low. Yes, my lawsuit. brother is. So he must like have he must have inherited some of that hurt yeah, fight. He's like my father, and I'm like my mother, basically. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, at the end, he got some little accommodation from the school, and I didn't. I said, "So look, what'd you win? You didn't win anything." He goes, "No, you don't understand. The next time this teacher is about to destroy some kid, they're gonna he's gonna stop and he's gonna think maybe this one's got a crazy father too." Wow. And Love that's that. all street corner. It's like, make them put some doubt in their head about they don't know what the hell's going to happen. Right. This, you know, we've been, he stopped once. Think about it again. Right. Think it again about it. Put a little doubt in their head about what's going to happen. Right. That this could happen. Right. Right. One question from the audience and we'll say goodnight to Rich. That was a breezy one hour, Rich. Uh -huh. uh, uh, this person wants to know, he said, you, apparently you have children. Uh, were they, are they, uh, influenced and impressed 
by their grandfather, Herbie. Yes, but they get my father at a very different age. You know, it's their grandfather. And you never you never feel about your grandfather like you do about your father. But my father would go in to all to every one of my kids school and tell the whole school the story that I grew up with, which is a little red ball story, which I won't. Maybe someday he'll turn it into a kid's book, but it's it's a sort of a parable about how you get what you want. It's you can negotiate anything shrunken down to a kid's story <laughs> with a and ball. Then he loved it, you know, uh -huh. and, the, and he was he's great with kids. And they, so, and your kids have seen him in that way the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Although once my uh, my my uh, oldest son, who then was like in middle school, played on a middle school basketball team. He was terrible. They were terrible. Okay, they couldn't even get the ball up to the basket. I don't even know what your why the score the final score is like five to four, and um, the team was coached by a couple of high school kids. And my father was unhappy with something about the way the team was running the offense. And at the end of the game, he said to me, "Do you mind if I go uh, talk to the coaches?" And I said, "Yes, yes, I do mind. That is going to end up in the local paper. This this is one you got to care not that much." Did, did, and he, did he do it? Did he? No, did, he, he, he respected me and did not talk to the, it, it, to these the 16 are your, year old coaches about how they should be running the triangle offense or something. Right. <laughs> these, <laughs> these are your kids after all. Right. All right. Uh, uh, let, before we say goodnight to Rich, let's see. I think we've got a couple closing. Yeah, we have an event uh, next week. I think it's next Wednesday. Uh, Folks Film Series, a new documentary from IFC Films. Hold your fire if you're a New Yorker of a certain age, you may remember, this was an infamous hostage negotiation. This is a very kind of thing that, that Herbie Cohen could have been involved in, mm. frankly. He might have been involved in, uh, where four guys uh, went into a sporting goods store to steal guns. And it ended up being the longest hostage negotiation in New York City history. And the person, the police psychologist, became after this sort of an, an expert on hostage negotiation crisis. I wouldn't be surprised if Rick says that, uh, that your father also did that sort of thing. Um, you know, cause he, in a way, wasn't just self-help. He was an amateur psychologist. Everything you've told us today yeah. is a lesson in psychology. So that's next Wednesday night. You'll get notices everyone to see the screening. Anything else, Madeline? Yeah, of course, yes. Uh, so go to folks.org, give us your email address so you'll get notices of future events. And uh, yes, we know that during the pandemic in particular, since we went virtual, Folks is now your favorite nonprofit. Uh, so we can always use some assistance. And so keep us nicely fresh and nice in your thoughts. Rich, uh, first of all, for those of you who want to buy the book, uh, you can buy it online right now in the, in, the, um, in the chat box. There's a link that takes you straight to purchase the book. Buy this book. It's <laughs> hilarious. It's very moving. I, I told you before that I thought it was one of my two favorite Rich Cohen books. Rich has now told you it's one of his favorite books, if not his favorite of his own book. You will learn a lot from this. You will learn about life. You'll learn a lot about people of a certain era. Uh, and you get a chance in some ways to get two books for one because it will be almost as if you've read uh, Herb, Herbie Cohen's book as well. Rich, always great to see you, always great to host you. We're big fans here of yours at Folks, and we wish you always well and always success in your writing, buddy. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. All right. I'm Thane Rosenbaum for Folks. Until next time. Good night, everyone. Bye.